As Washington continues to churn toward impeachment hearings, Michigan keeps fighting its budget battle, while the DIA asked to pass the hat two years early. Cool or not cool? And Mitch Albom's most personal story yet, his new memoir, Finding Chica. Today is Sunday, November 10th, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. The colder weather has moved in. We have hit November 10th, and we can pretty much see the holidays from here but so much for our long winter's nap. This week, Democrats in Congress told us we can expect the impeachment proceedings to run right through the holiday season. Wrapped up, though, just before Christmas. And if Michael Bloomberg is really committed to getting into the Democratic run for the White House, that campaign will only intensify, too. But while all of us have been focusing so much on the nation's capital, a lot of other things have been churning. From the budget negotiations in Lansing to more corruption troubles for the United Auto Workers. On Wednesday, we got word that the Detroit Institute of Arts wants a new millage on next spring's ballot. That's a big ask for money that we were told would not be coming. What gives? We're going to talk about that just ahead. And a little bit later, Mitch Album will be here to talk about his new book, which also means talking about one of the great heartbreaks of his life, and yet one of the most powerful lessons in love that he and his wife Janine could ever experience as they loved and lost their sweet Chica. It's all this morning on Flashpoint. So much talk about this morning from the UAW corruption mess uh, while trying to negotiate new contracts to a wild situation at Wayne State where several board members believe they have fired President Roy Wilson who along with several other board members believes he's not going anywhere. But I want to start with the DIA's plan uh, for an early ask on a new 10 year millage and to sort it all out for me this morning. Let's bring in the round table. Stephen Henderson is here from Detroit Today at WDET. Chad Livengoods, the senior editor of Crane's Detroit Business. Zoe Clark is the host of It's Just Politics on Michigan <laughs> Public Radio. And Nolan Finley, editorial chief for the Detroit News. And Nolan, let me start with you. I have really enjoyed telling people that Detroit was a city that was largely saved by art. Mm -hmm. When you get back to it, the effort to save everything that was at the DIA, I think, exposed this love of art, and it helped us then save so many other things, mm -hmm. even though there was a lot of, I don't want to make it sound like it was painless coming out of bankruptcy. It wasn't for a lot of people. But, exactly. But we all seem to have an understanding that we had set the DIA on a, on a path that we thought we understood. Your editorial at the Detroit News takes mm -hmm. great issue with their new request. Well, sure. I mean, it... They came, when the DIA, before the bankruptcy in 2012, was looking for this millage so that they could get a, a period of time in which they could build an endowment, an operating endowment, mm -hmm. to sustain the DIA without coming to taxpayers. They promised, give us this 10 years and we won't ask for a renewal. They said it over and over and over again. And we supported them. I'm sure they came and told you the same thing. We will not ask for a renewal. And so not only now are they asking for a renewal two years early, but they're trying to slip it through on perhaps the most selective low turnout election uh, of the year uh, during the presidential primary. There's a, there's a sleazy feel to that, that they're trying to not only have they lied to the voters about their promise, now they're trying to, to get this thing passed very deceptively. Uh, no tax issue should ever be on a presidential primary ballot. Stephen Henderson, do, is it just my imagination or do I feel you moving forward in your seat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have pretty close ties with the DIA and I, I know what is going on there. If you pick your facts instead of looking at all of them, I guess you can come to any conclusion you want. The truth is that over the last seven years, the, the museum has raised their endowment to $230 million. They've also been asked to contribute $100 million to the city's bankruptcy a bankruptcy they had nothing to do with, really. They didn't cause that. And so without the $100 million going to bankruptcy, they'd be pretty close to the $400 million that they said they wanted to raise. They'd be in better shape than they are now. The truth is that these millages also paid not for the operations of the museum, but for all kinds of services that were added after 2012. Uh, there are tens of thousands of school children and seniors that the museum pays to bring to the museum every day. It's open another day of the week that it wasn't open before. And so if you punish the museum by taking this money from them, you're actually not punishing the museum at all. The museum will continue to but, operate. But, you're punishing the people who benefit Steve, from the, the museum. The museum knew it was going to offer these news. That was part of the problem. 
the promise. Well, that's what they counties asked their, of them. No, no, that's what counties ballooned. asked of them with the millages. If they weren't going to be able to do it, then they shouldn't have made the promise. But well, they, they are able to do it. They're spending 50%. They promised to be fiscally responsible and use this period to All build an endowment. All of that spending is from the millages and it's so, being spent on so the things they were on, asked on, on the point, is, the, is it a cynic? Is it cynical to move it into an election where the electorate is mostly going to be Democrats? Cynical or opportunistic, of course, but show me one organization that, that doesn't think this way. They realize that likely there will be a Democratic uh, turnout in mm. March without Republicans. They're looking to raise funds. I, I'm just shocked at how political the, the overall debate is about it. It seems to me they they ask for this uh, it, it from un different leadership, right? The leadership has changed. Uh, there, It's two years early. It's not like it's a decade early or something. And it's just a renewal. It's not any bit it's more a money they or not to ask for. for well, but not, but not everything years, changed though. after they asked and, for. And just a second. And the other thing is, is it cynical though to do it in March? Absolutely. But welcome to 2019. <laughs> welcome to American <laughs> politics. The idea political. that we're calling anyone out for being political in this day and age is comical. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a worry. And we're going to have a loaded ballot in Wayne County with uh, ballot initiatives. You're going to have possibly uh, the, the $250 million bonds for the city of Detroit for Mayor right, Duggan's. For the, um, um, the light, project, light right? illumination. You're going to have an after school millage. It's a tax increase in Wayne County to fund after school programs. And then you're going to have this other one. I mean, th there's there's going to be some people that are going to say, wait, this is just groups that are just, just picking the election and front loading it with all Democrats because there will not be Republicans unless they come right. and cross over and try to, you know, to have, try so to take out someone or vote Mike Bloomberg uh, as the nominee <laughs> or something. <laughs> you're going to have <laughs> predominantly a bunch of Democrats. That's a good wrinkle there. So here's the other thing that people are are eyeing, and this is this is important. In August, there's going to be a jail millage in Macomb County right. that is going to bring out a lot of anti-tax voters, uh, sure. presumably Republicans, who would cost most of these uh, these ballot issues uh, heavily at the at the at the box. DIA is one of them, right? Uh, it, it, it passed narrowly in Macomb. I think they were trying to avoid this millage, but you're going to see a lot of people stay away from August because of that turnout in Macomb. Yeah, but March is. Going you to be can't do November. Low. We should never have uh, tax issues on any elections other than August and November. You want the broadest number of people who will be paying taxes but you to can't participate do November. in the election. All right, let's, I, I want to get to a number of other issues here. So, Chad, uh, let's go back to some <laughs> other money matters, and that's what's going on with the budget fight in Lansing. Uh, Governor Whitmer uh, kind of uh, took a huge risk in obviously wiping out a billion dollars worth of projects that a lot of people really like. I think she wants us to believe that they've only been put on hold, but we don't have a deal at the moment. What's going to happen? Yeah, right now, basically, things stand that uh, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky wants um, the governor to essentially sign away some of her of her gubernatorial powers uh, involving a really obscure state um, board called the State Administrative Board that some legislators didn't even know existed um, three or four weeks ago. But now it's the center of this Same entire this program budget fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's, it's basically always been around it to approve contracts and now because the governor used it to move around 600 million dollars um, in contrary to how the legislature wanted money spent they want her to agree to uh, not do that and they want an enforceable what's known as enforceable boilerplate that's like the new uh, term of the day in, in Lansing and they want to be able to make sure that the governor can't do this she's resisting she doesn't want to sign away her her, her rights or the rights of the next governor uh, and, and, and and give the legislature power and so now it's just basically a fight over power. She tried to cut a deal with House Speaker Lee Chatfield this week. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky apparently, he was not in the room and didn't e like that. Exactly. There, in fact, it sounds like absolutely was a deal between the Republican House Speaker, the Democratic uh, Governor. And, and the thing I've been saying about all of this is right now you've got almost a billion dollars of money that is caught up right now in political, I don't know if you want to say games, but this is not a natural disaster. This is not a circa 2000 budget. Uh, fiscal problems of being in the whole two billion dollars. This no. is a problem that state legislatures and this governor have brought on them to themselves and are now trying to figure out how to get out of it. And and they really have no one but to look at in the mirror and go, this is affecting millions of dollars and millions of folks when it comes to safety patrols, uh, foster care programs, 
Autism uh, Alliance. Yeah, I'm not again, sure bipartisan. voters are singling out uh, this no, person I think is this to is, blame. I They're think just this a pox is, on all your houses. It's a pox on all of your houses, and it is reminding, I think, a lot of folks of what is going on in D.C. and is yeah. exactly what, let's remember, this governor and this legislature said they were not going to do at the beginning of the year. Uh, Stephen, your radio program emanates from the campus of Wayne State uh, every <laughs> weekday morning. Uh, can you tell me what in the heck is going on in that boardroom and administrative offices? I'm tell not, all of us, I'm not please. sure yes. anyone knows. I certainly don't know firsthand, uh, but from what I see from the outside, I mean, this is, this is a pretty bitter political fight playing out uh, in a campus uh, in, environment and, and affecting a, a leader who I think probably hasn't done uh, a whole lot to deserve this kind of uh, distraction from the job he's trying to do. I mean, I think there are things that he's done well. I think there are things that maybe he could do better. This seems not to be about his performance so much as it is about the alliances on that board. Uh, and, and he's sort of caught in, in the middle. Uh, I, I think it's an embarrassment for the university to be playing out this way. Uh, yeah. Nolan wrote a piece this week about yeah. how hard it would be to attract someone the caliber of Roy Wilson if you fired him under these circumstances. Apparently, and that's exactly right. They didn't like all the attention the MSU board was getting, exactly. apparently, for, <laughs> for fabulous crazy, governance. Right? So <laughs> they were like, throw me in, coach. <laughs> but, I mean, this is going to get serious because, as, as, as we said, they're not going to be able to attract a new president if the, of his caliber if they run him out. Who would come to this situation? But you also got the accreditation at one of the, the major um, medical programs yeah, yeah. suspended. So you've got people who have spent up to seven years in this program, not sure now their work is going to be certified. That's serious, and it will impact their ability to draw students. Uh, I think it's time for the governor. Seven of these eight board members are Democrats. She should have some influence. The governor should step in, see what lever leverage she can exert to get them to work together. And if she can't, she needs to start selectively removing board members and replacing them with mm -hmm. people who will act in the best interest of the university. There, there's a other bigger business issue right now, and that involves Detroit Medical Center and all the relationships yep. of Wayne State Med School uh, and the doctors groups. They've had uh, just a really acrimonious relationship uh, they've been out looking you know they've been at one point they were courting Henry Ford um, my editor M Mike Lee suggested this week that Mich University of Michigan uh, ought to just consider stepping in and buying the DMC take Wayne State out of the whole equation just given how yeah. co toxic it has become in that relationship so there's, no, there's more than just Roy Wilson's career on on the line here there's also just the operation of, of hospitals that serve the poorest children in, in America you would have thought the free tuition uh, uh, announced, but would have been the, the life of the of the conversation for so much longer. Before we have to wrap it up for the break, I'm really curious from all of you, Michael Bloomberg, should he make a full-throated entry into this, is it a blip or a tidal wave? I, I think it could be the opening of a floodgate. I don't think he's the only person who's looking at the field and the race now and thinking, maybe I could do better for Democratic voters. Uh, there was a story about Eric Holder thinking about it yep, this week. Yep. I think this is going to be the story. Going yeah. Michael Bloomberg is not going to win the Iowa caucuses but if he goes to Super Tuesday tries to cl and goes on the on television in Texas and California Joe Biden doesn't have money to go on, t on TV in Texas and California but B Bloomberg could he could just run a separate campaign and wait for everyone to get there exhausted and out of money no money worries mm, I don't see it happening I don't I think I think uh, voters are already paying attention to some of the candidates and someone this late I, I, I don't know I think they're paying attention but they're not like what they've seen uh, yeah. and Michael Blur Bloomberg scored a big victory in Virginia basically bought the house for Democrats there. I think he's riding a high. Hmm. You gotta leave it there, gang. When we come back, Mitch Alvin here to talk about his new book, Fighting Chief. Thanks very much, friends. <laughs> the region is on the rise. Project after project, building, growing, innovating. We're building the future right now. Hard work matters here. IBEW Local 58 electricians and NECA signatory contractors bring commitment, pride, expertise, and passion to every job. It's our code of excellence. One vision, one team, one mission. To build the very best Michigan for all of us. Put us to work for you. The best contractors, the best electricians, period. No matter how early you're up or how late you're running, when you start your day at Speedway, we've got what you need to have a good morning. We've got it hot. We've got it cold. We've got it sprinkled. We've got it ready. We're here to make your morning a little better. Because when you get off to a better start, 
you go on to a better day. And now get any size coffee for 99 cents when you buy any breakfast sandwich or donut. It's official. Serta chose Gardner White to bring you this exclusive mattress, Steel. Sunday and Monday, get a free power base with every Serta. Other stores charge $9.99 for this perfect sleeper. Your price, $5.99, and the power adjustable base is free. Do whatever you want in bed, in any position. Say hello to iComfort's carbon fiber memory foam, and goodbye to sleeping hot. Save $600 now, only $11 a month with a free power base and free same-day delivery. We will not be undersold on any mattress. Don't overpay. Hurry to Gardner White. Monday at 5, the SWAT team is about to storm this city. These look like bad guys, but are they? This looks like a normal city. They have a church, they have an apartment building. But what's really going on? We're taking you behind the scenes of SWAT training the with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. See how local police are training to protect you. Hope and prayer is not a strategy in our world. Defender cameras give you exclusive access to the action. Monday on Local 4 News at 5. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That is sweet little Chica, the Haitian orphan who was basically adopted by Mitch Album and his wife Janine. They changed her short life, her all too brief life, quite a bit. Uh, but the real story in the new book, Finding Chica, is about the way that Chica changed their lives. And it's great to have Mitch Album back with us again on Flashpoint. Mitch, thanks very much for coming. Nice to see you, Devin. Um, uh, uh, you wrote so many columns and pieces. I think a lot of us, I told you, I felt like I already knew Chica before the book came out. But her, extra, her life was so extraordinary in so many ways, especially just the way she came into the world. Yeah. Three days after that awful Three earthquake. Days before. Well, before the awful earthquake. Three days before the earthquake on the third day of her life was sleeping on her mother's chest inside a little cinder block house. The earth shook. The wall fell down this way, fell down this way, and the roof fell off backwards, and they were exposed to the heavens but survived. Yeah. The third night of her life, she slept out in the sugarcane fields and slept there for weeks in the dirt. So she was born pretty tough, uh, but I never knew how tough she would actually have to be. Yeah, no doubt. You also could have not have seen how she was going to end up changing your life. No. You know, she came to us when she was three years old when her mother died in that same cinder block house, giving birth to a baby brother with no doctor present, just a midwife who didn't know what to do when yeah. there was an incident. And um, for the first couple of years, she was like the bossiest kid we had. She told all the older kids when they could go to the bathroom, when they could play, what toys they could go with. We just kind of characterized her as, well, that's bossy chica. Uh, and then when she was five, um, she developed a, a, what turned out to be a very serious brain tumor. And we didn't know at the time. We brought her up from Haiti thinking, well, American medicine, they'll fix everything. A couple months, she'll go back. And we were told uh, after they opened her up and, and took a look, yeah. sorry, she has something called DIPG, which is the same thing Chad Carr, we know, right, the grandson right. of Lloyd Carr, uh, ended up having. And it's always fatal. And she has maybe four months left to live. And I said, well, what should we do? And they said, well, just take her back to Haiti and let her play. And it'll just debilitate her. She'll die there. And I knew how tough she was. And I said, we're not going to do that. If there's a chance of fighting, she's a fighter and we're going to fight. And uh, that's what we did. And she lived two years, which is almost unheard of with yeah. the IPG, yeah. as we traveled around the world. And although she didn't look like us, talk like us, come from the same country as us, or come from our own DNA, she made us a family as much as any little girl or daughter could make two people a family. You and Janine haven't had kids of your own before. Oh, right. and, but in a way, you, you knew you were kind of signing up, not exactly for a fool's errand, but you knew it was going to end in heartbreak. Janine didn't. She mm. honestly believed that Chica was going to be a miracle. I have seen probably maybe too much of the world, and, and you know, I wanted to believe it. Yeah. Uh, but either way, you know, whether you get seven years with a child or 70 years with a child, Every day is still precious, and you know one of the things I say in the book is is we didn't lose a child; we were given a child. And for however long you get to have a child, um, it is a life-changing experience, especially one who had so little other alternatives. 
and she was funny and smart and mm -hmm. never scared and she <laughs> went through this whole process of you know having her head shaved and 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 going on steroids and getting big and then getting yeah. small and never once complained she was just on this amazing little journey you know living in america having her own parents you know two parents for the first time in the same house and all that uh you know doting on her and um she changed us along the way yeah far more than we changed her. You, your books have sold something like 40 million copies. And whatever reputation you have, I think, is built on your ability to write about life's important things, love, care, empathy, understanding each other. And yet, even after all those books, 40 million of them, my hunch is you learned a lot that you thought you knew before. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, the hardest book I've ever had to write. It's the most personal book I've ever written. Yeah. I believe it's the best thing I've ever written, and, and yes, that includes Tuesdays with Maury. It doesn't matter, it's just how I feel, because I, I, wanted, I wanted the world to know who she was. You know, if she died at seven years old, the least I could do was sort of give her the extension in years by telling her story, but also to show it's, it's not a sad book. In fact, from the very first page, you already know that she passes yeah, away, yeah. and it's told in a conversation to her, me talking to her because she always comes and visits me, you know, and she does when I'm at my desk, and she used to be uh, playing on the floor with me, so I go down now to my desk and I just sort of have these conversations. And you Every day, I'm Every assuming, day, right? you yes. know, I mean, she's never not with me. And, uh, you know, I want people to know that there are many ways to become a family. And it's never too late, um, and it's never wrong. If you're adopted, if you take somebody in a foster family, if somebody just moves in with you and becomes, there's so many different ways that you can learn from them. And Chica, you know, towards the end, I had to carry her um, yeah. wherever we went. Yeah. She couldn't walk anymore. So to the bathroom, to the bedroom, to the kitchen table, whatever. I was her <laughs> vehicle. And we were sitting at a table once like this, and we were coloring. And I, I looked at my watch. I realized I was late for the radio show. And so I popped up. I said, Chica, I got to go. She said, no, Mr. Mitch, stay and play. I said, Chica, I, I have to work. And she said, Mr. Mitch, I have to play. I said, I know, Chica. It's but her this job. Is different. I said, this is my job. And she said, no, it's not. She crossed her arms. She said, your job is carrying me. And after I laughed, I realized, you know, boy, is that ever a sentence? Because, of course, my job was carrying her. All of our jobs is carrying our children, and particularly yeah. children who don't have options, like the kids, the orphans that we raise in Haiti. And so she taught me about what to carry. And as I've come to realize as I've gotten older, I, I think this is going to end up sort of being my third act of life, that my, what I'm going to carry is going to be children. I, I have 52 kids that we raise in Haiti. Yeah. I want every one of them to be college educated. I'm there every month. We have two already in college here, and my goal is the other 50 are going to get up here and go to college, have dinner with us on Sunday nights, and mm -hmm. then go back to Haiti and make their country better. Back in the early 90s, I was, I, was, I was embedded with a military unit during Operation Restore Democracy in Haiti. My last day in Haiti, we were going to visit an orphanage. And I thought, I'm not sure, as much sadness as I've seen while I've been here, this is going to be really awful to handle. It ended up being the happiest place that I went because these were children who actually had somebody taking care of them, which yeah. says a lot in a nation that's as dysfunctional as Haiti. Yeah. Um, she ends up being, in a way, an avatar for, for all of these children yeah. you've, you've been taking yeah. care of. Well, you know, we have children who were left to die in the woods when they were four weeks old. Uh, we have children who were dropped off at medical clinics and never picked up for several years. No one ever came back for them. Yeah. We have children who were found hiding under roofs that had been their home, and then a hurricane blew it away, and they were dug in a hole underneath. In some cases, we've had to make up names, birthdays. <laughs> get passports and paperwork, and yet these are happy children, and they deserve a place in the world, and they are grateful, and they sing their prayers every night with great passion. You saw Chica at the beginning singing, mm -hmm. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. Yeah. Well, I believe that that's true. I believe all children are children of God, and it's our role to take care of them. I'm not, I'm not advocating for anybody to go to Haiti and do the things I do. I just happen to end up there. My life is a series of accidents, Kevin. <laughs> Tuesdays with Maury was an accident. This is an accident. I just go where the accidents take me. But, but Sports I, writing was an accident. Yeah, you were going to be a yeah, musician. Yeah, right. Funny thing happened right. on the way to the game. You know, I wasn't even supposed to be here. I, was, <laughs> I just took a detour. But, um, you know, so be it. That's my lot in life. And, and yeah. to help these children, I'm proud to do it. And I, I want people to, to know Every penny from this book goes yep. to the orphanage. I didn't write this book for profit or gain. I wrote it because I hope people want to share in a story about what we learn from our children. That's really what it's about. And 
it will enable me to continue to raise those kids down in the orphanage. The book is Finding Chica. It's out right now, and as he always does, Mitch is uh, making the rounds of a lot of book tours to come uh, talk about the book and sign someplace near you, and you can find that information. We'll link uh, Mitch's website on our website at clickondetroit.com. Mitch, thanks so much. Congratulations on, I know, a, a really difficult and yet loving task. You've always been very kind to me on my work. Thank you, Devin. I, I, I'm a fan. Back with more on Flashpoint right after this. For guiding harvest is a lifesaver for a mother like myself with children and having so many snacks and lunches to make. The food from Forgotten Harvest make me feel better in school. Because these children around this community really look for Forgotten Harvest. And I thank Forgotten Harvest for helping me and my family out. Forgotten Harvest needs your support to help families in need. We need your help today. Have you or a loved one served in the military, suffering from anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder? The Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network has a veteran navigator that can get you and your family the services you need, whether it's employment assistance, benefits, housing, or counseling. Contact the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network, your link to holistic health care. Here to talk, here to help, 24-7, 800-241-4949. Delta Dental of Michigan is building brighter futures in Metro Detroit by supporting teachers, by investing in neighborhoods, by giving back day in and day out so we can all enjoy healthy, smart, vibrant communities. Learn about Delta Dental of Michigan and the work we're doing in your neighborhood at deltadentalmi.com. Take a behind-the-scenes tour of the Parade Company, a wonderland of fantasy and imagination. Parade Company studio tours feature the larger-than-life floats in America's Thanksgiving Parade presented by Art Van, the world's largest paper mache head collection, and a sneak peek at artists working on their masterpieces. The Parade Studio will delight children and adults of all ages. Schedule your tour today at theparade.org. Be a part of the magic. There's more Mitch coming up. Mitch Albums, Heart of Detroit. Then meet the press. Have a great week. We'll see you next time right back here for Flashpoint.